Okay, so, so we, we are busy with the series. Um, if you're new to the series, I invite you to go watch the other two online. Um, the, it, I, it, I always try to create series that kind of build upon each other because I believe that God wants to lead us somewhere. And, and we as people, I can't just give you one theme, uh, just one word, and think that's going to impact your life because we are complicated. We have many different things that make us up, that, make, that forms us as indiv ind individuals and as people and as couples and as leaders. Um, so it's important to, to talk on all the different aspects of life um, as it relates to God's Word. The, this morning while we were praying before the time, it's, it's like God is, is saying to me, listen, I'm, like our call is to not only make God practical, because I can give you practical things that you can go do in your life, and you can apply these things, and it's probably going to work. But it's to make God real in your, wow, I just felt like a teenage boy. Um, was that a crack in my voice? Um, no, so I want, I want, yes, it was. I want God to be real to you, but for, for every area, I want it to impact your life every single day. Um, it, being happy, like when we look at happiness, being happy is, it's, it's not, there's no TED talk that's going to get you happy, right? There's, there's, there's no uh, five-week course on, on, you know, how to grab hold of your happiness. The reality, happiness is something um, which we have discovered in week one. It's, it's not a what. It's, it's not uh, that thing that's going to make me happy. It's not a bigger house, a better car. Um, it's not stuff. It's not a what. But we've discovered in week one, it is a who, which is Jesus Christ. Now that I've discovered who it is, it means that in order to remain happy, I have to start building relationship with him so that I'm able to live out my life with this who that I discovered. And it doesn't happen in a moment. So, so we discovered that happiness is, is not a what, um, but it's a who. We also discovered that happiness isn't something that just shows up. Happiness is sowing. What are you sowing into your life in order for you to get the results to be happy? Um, sowing makes you happy. You, you sow your way into happiness, but many of us have sowed our way out of happiness also. And the good news is if you've sowed your way out of happiness, you can sow your way back in again. What things are you sowing into your life to, to get you to that place where you are happy, where you are blessed, where you are favored, um, where you, where you live a life where you get up in the morning and you're like excited about there's a new day that God has for you. He's given you one more day to make a difference. Um, that, that, it, that passion that many of us lack, and, and it's got to do with sowing. Happiness is an outcome. It's a result. It's a result of what you're sowing in your life, and it takes time. Um, if, if you've sowed yourself into bad, and, and I don't know, so I'm starting to breed with chickens. For those of you that don't know, we, we're breeding chickens at home. Right, I'm not personally breeding with them. <laughs> we're breeding chickens at home. Like, uh, when somebody says that as somebody who's farming, what they mean is they've got chickens and they are breeding. So, so we are breeding with chickens. Um, because when, if I say we are breeding with chickens, you might think me and Ermery together are breeding with chickens. But we're not breeding. We are farming with chickens. Everybody clear? Good. Let's move on. So discovered, you, you get different kinds of chickens. Did you know that there's like thousands of species of chickens? Like, and they, and they grow up differently. Some of them um, take months from being a chick to being an adult. Like most layer chickens take an average to six months before they actually become producing layer chickens. Most, most chickens that we eat um, on our plates at homes and that we, we buy in store, it's, if, if it took six months, do you know how big the farms have to be to be able to keep chickens for six months before they start producing food? So, so the chicken that's a food chicken, the one that you eat, takes six to eight weeks to, to go from the place of being a chick to being an adult. It's the same with your life is a chicken. Do you understand that there are some areas in your life where you are sowing? Let's take the wrong first. Let's start with that. You've been sowing wrong for years. 
right? You've been sowing wrong for years. And, and that thing that you've been sowing wrong in, it's been growing slowly. And, and some of you are at that place where that wrong seed that you've been sowing has turned into an adult chicken. And it's starting to produce eggs that you don't want in your life. And then there's other areas where, man, you've only been sowing for four to six weeks into this thing. And it's produced a bird that you can eat now and you are stuck with that thing. Sowing takes time for different things in our lives. But I'm telling you, if you keep sowing wrong, it will, it's going to produce, the outcome's going to happen. But it's the same for the good things. You might have been sowing wrong into your relationship with your wife for years. You haven't honored her. You haven't respected her. You, you haven't treated her as somebody who God has made beautiful and wonderful. Now, you can start changing that. You can start sowing into that relationship. And I truly believe by God's grace, He can take something that you've been sowing incorrectly for years, and He can bring a miraculous turnaround in months. In weeks. But some of us, we don't want to see time. We just want, well, I tried it this week. It didn't work. But listen, buddy, you've been sowing for years. You, you've actually raised something that is not supposed to be there. Now, now we can sow our way out. And for happiness, I want you to hear me. Um, I have people that have spoke to me and say, you know, uh, my life it's not where I want it to be, and I don't know why it is where it is where I am right now. My only answer that I have for you is based on what I see in the Word. Have you applied the principles accurately on the Word based on His promises consistently? Have you been sowing in the right direction with your health, with your mind, with the people that you're surrounded with? That is why it's so important to be in a church. Because coming to church on Sunday mornings and being surrounded with people that encourage and uplift, it's like watering the seed. It's like working the soil. It's like getting other people to come and prune some branches. Like, uh, um, where's Anoma? I think she's serving in kids. Oh, she's over here. Yeah, some, somebody said to her, I'm going to keep you accountable for your word. And it was somebody who's not even in the church. We in the church should keep each other accountable for the, the seed that we are sowing. We should keep our friends accountable for what they are sowing. Why? Because we want to see people produce fruit that's good. I want them to be happy. I want them to be blessed. I want them to be favored. So, so based on, on what? Many people sow because they don't have clarity. They don't have vision. They don't have direction. So, so they're sowing, you know, and, they, and they're sowing incorrectly. You know how many people I know that have sown incorrectly financially? Many. You know why? Because they think it's a blank check that they can cash. Well, God, I'm going to, here you go. I'm going to give this amount now. I've heard pastors say at other, you know, you, you've seen these clips. The first 10 people that give $1,000 right now, it's going to get a million by the end of two months. Absolute nonsense. There's no principle like that in God's word. And then people run with the $1,000 to be the first 10. Let's test that. <laughs> the first 50 Okay, no, so it's nonsense, right? We can sow seed incorrectly. We need God's clarity, God's vision, and God's wisdom. In the charismatic world, we, we are um, opposed to, or not opposed, it's sometimes we're so scared of the people who don't welcome God's spirit that we become so the opposite that we lose the whole thing in between where we're supposed to be. Right? We, we miss it. So we need God's vision, God's clarity. And remember, what, what's the first thing God did? He said, and God looked, God um, formed the heavens and the earth. And God said that the earth was null and void and without form. And then God said what? Let there be light. Now the same thing. If you want God to create this incredible earth, this place to live, this, this kingdom of God in your life, allow light to be. In your life, which is his wisdom. So we find his wisdom for happiness. One of the best scriptures for me and most popular ones that we know, and we looked at it last week, and then it's the Beatitudes, the blessed. Um, so we have to choose as a people, we have to choose to sow these things into our lives. Um, we have to choose to be poor in spirit, which meaning, not meaning that I'm a worm, oh, I'm so sorry that I'm alive. No, it means I am, I choose 
every day to be dependent on God. My choice is to say, God, I depend on you. I trust your word first. That's what I'm depending on. Um, those who mourn, take account. Somebody has passed away. You go to a funeral. You mourn. You take account that life is fragile. Life is, is a moment. We take account that, that we're not going to live forever in this body on this earth. We take account to know that we must make our lives count. We mourn. We are aware. Bless who are meek. You are powerful. You're like this wild, tamed animal that can bite and destroy people. But yet, under God's control, you are humble and you are meek and you are gentle and you are kind because that's how God directs and steers you, right? We are meek. Bless those who, who hunger for right standing with God. You search out right standing. You search out how I can be in better standing with God. Um, uh, we have some friends in our lives and I'm, I'm so encouraged to see that things went wrong and what are they doing? They are searching out God's way to make things right. That is somebody who's hungering and thirsting to be in right standing. Are you hungry to be in right standing with God with every area of your life? For every area of your life. Those who show mercy. And those who are generous with mercy, even to the ones who don't deserve it. Those, and these are all things we're sowing. Those who are pure in heart. Why pure in heart? Because if you want to see God's fruit in your life, God only works in purity. Meaning those who desire good things. Desire for, for the, the people to succeed. Not desiring for people to fail. Not desiring for people to get hurt. Not desiring. Having pure desires, we see God work in it. The Bible says we see him. Um, those who choose peace. I choose to be a peacemaker. You can choose to stay in offense like some of you. Um, this morning there might be some moments of it later on. You can choose or you can choose to say, listen, I, I have peace because I know it's God's word speaking to me. I choose to be in peace. And those who stand the ground on God's principles for your life, those who are persecuted for righteousness sake. I stand in God's principles. What will they get? They will inherit the kingdom of God. What is the, uh, the kingdom of heaven? What is the kingdom of heaven? The kingdom of heaven is like a man who finds a treasure in a field. He goes and he digs up this treasure. And when he opens his, it up, it is so valuable that he leaves everything else that he has because of the value of this. So blessed are those who stand Stand for the principles of God because the kingdom of heaven is the greatest treasure that you can inhabit. The kingdom of heaven is like a mustard seed that's planted, so small, so tiny, doesn't mean a lot. It's covered by, by dirt. But then the kingdom of heaven has the potential to take the smallest of seeds, to produce this incredible living tree that feeds birds, that takes care. That's where they, they make their nest, that, that nurtures the ground. That's the kingdom of heaven. So those who choose to go after God's principles to stand on them and not to be a Bible basher and hurt other people who choose not to because they've got a choice also. They can choose not to, but you choose to do it. You will see heaven. So, so these are things that we're sowing. Okay, so, so there you caught up. Now you don't have to go watch the video. So you are sowing for life. I am sowing for life. Do, do you understand that principle? I am sowing for life. I'm sowing for life. I want life. I want life um, it, to the place where, where I get up, I'm excited, I'm looking forward. I don't, I'm sowing for tonight, I'm going to go to bed and I've got peace. I'm sleeping. I've got rest, man. I've got rest. And I'm sowing into it. And you know what is one of the biggest things that steals people's peace at night? Uh, one of the areas where people struggle and they sow the most incorrectly. Um, one of the areas where, where people um, think they know what they're doing, but they don't. Money. And some of you are going, I'm visiting, and he's going to talk about money. <laughs> it's one of the areas that steals people's peace. We said before, anything that steals your peace is stealing your happiness. Anything that steals your peace steals your happiness. Have you, have you heard this, this statement um, where we say the following... I thought I knew what would make me happy. Have you heard that statement? Have you ever said that? I thought I knew what would make me happy, and I pursued it. Don't believe everything you think you knew. 
That means don't believe everything that you think at this point. Maybe um, in your life, the way you think in regards to finances and money. Don't, don't think that you know everything about it. I want to make a confession. I don't. I don't know everything about money. But what I do know is I have found principles in God's word that I've applied to my life in regards to money. And I've seen how those principles have caused me to have peace. Because anything that steals your peace is stealing your happiness. A lot of people think, I think money would make me happy. How many of you would, would say, I think money would make me happy? How many have heard pastors says, uh, pastors have said the following preachers, money won't make you happy? Have you heard that before? Money won't make you happy. Yeah, I've heard that before. Um, and I've heard that preached, and I kind of said to myself on the inside, I probably have to say amen on the outside. But on the inside, I kind of feel money will make me happy. Right? Is there like a server I can sign up for and we can just test this thing? <laughs> right? It's like you think something on the inside, but you don't say that on the outside. It's like, honey, do these jeans make me look fat? <laughs> you're thinking something on the inside, which you know you can't say on the outside. And then you take um, marriage course 101. Honey, you're beautiful in whatever you wear. What do you think these jeans make you look like? <laughs> right? Use wisdom, especially in those areas. My, my honest opinion, I think money can make you happy. I do. Don't turn off now. Well, some of you are actually only switching on now. <laughs> it's like, what? Yeah, I like this message. Yeah. <laughs> I want that one. I want money. Um, I honestly think it can. I think money plays a role in our happiness. Um, I, I think there is a major connection between money and happiness. Um, and the conclusion, I'm not done yet, just for this one line, <laughs> that I hope that you get to at the end is money plays a big part in you being happy. It does. doesn't matter how, how much, how little, how middle you have. Money plays a big role in it. See, where, where we get it wrong as a people is, is when we think, um, we assume the connection between happiness and money. We assume the connection between happiness and money is the following word. More. Do not run ahead of me, please. We think it's the word more. If I have more money, then I will be happy. See, in most people's minds, we, we think that it's just the quantity I have that's not making me happy right now. We think if I've got more, then I'll be happy, I'll be satisfied. Here's the question. How much more money do you want before you're going to be happy? How much more? Have you ever, And I've got the answer for every single one of you. I've got the answer to that question. How much more money do you need to be happy? You want the answer? More than I have right now. That's the answer for every single one of us. How much more money? More than I have right now. And if you're in your 20s, you're going, yeah, I don't know. Eh? I just kind of have like a measuring stick. I just want to be able to drive a nice car and have a house. Like, just wait. <laughs> oh, ye of young years. It doesn't matter. I was this week, I was, I was kind of a bit shocked. I was invited by a friend to go play golf. Um, and it was great. Beautiful day. Um, and played with, with one guy that I knew, two guys I didn't know at all. Right? So total strangers I'm playing with. Um, and so we playing golf and they're, kind of, they're all businessmen. They're all in business, right? Business. So, and, they talk, and they're talking business the whole time. I'm like, shh, I'm golfing. Right? <laughs> like, I'm quiet, which is not normal. So... 
But the reason I'm quiet is, is because of how they're talking about money. Like normal conversations for us, if we had to talk about money, would be maybe, you know, a few hundred dollars here or maybe a thousand dollar there, right? A thousand, you know, I had to spend a thousand. These people, their vocabulary were in millions. Like they're talking in millions. Well, I had to spend 45 million there. And, I just, and as I'm golfing, I'm going, man, I guess I hope you tithe. <laughs> right, I'm like, oh, Right, like so, <laughs> these guys are talking millions, 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 and eventually you get to the inevitable question where the two guys that don't know me start asking me the question. So, what do you do for a living? <laughs> I'm a pastor, and he went, "Oh, so anyway, so you go." <laughs> that was great. No effect whatsoever. But here's the reality is, when you kind of think, you know, you have a mindset of oh, what is enough, how much is, how much is more, you know, um, when you, there's always more than what you think more is. There's never, in, never enough. Um, the correlation between your money and your happiness is not the word more. Um, and I'm hoping that this morning's message will get you to a place where you can actually not only hear what I'm going to say now, not only hit your heart, but you're going to apply it to your life because I believe it can turn the areas. One of the biggest areas in marriage counseling that we sit with, one of the biggest marriage killers there is in this world is money. It kills marriages. It kills it. There's a saying that the world has, if money walks out the front door, she walks out the back door. Please hear me. This is not to, to degrade anybody. I know of at least 10 marriages where that was the case. If I say 10 out of 15 that has gone through separation, five of them might have been regarding adulterous relationships. 10, money. There is a connection between money and our happiness, it's not the word more. What it is, though, for us who believe in Jesus Christ, it is the word managed. We, the Bible uses a different word. It uses the word steward. How you manage your money will determine if you will have happiness. Happiness is the truth. Uh, thank you. Happiness is the truth. Uh, and happiness, we find in God's word. So, so if we want happiness, we discover it from the truth. And God's word speaks regarding it. So he says the word that we would use is the word manage. It's not about how much you have, but it's how you manage what you have that will determine if you will be happy. It's not the amount of, it's the management of. In other words, money can contribute to your happiness if you manage it well. Anything that steals your peace steals your happiness. It disrupts your peace. So in any area where you feel that you've lost control, that you feel like I'm not in control of it right now, in any area like that, it means that if there's anxiety, if there's stress, if, if there's um, um, anything that causes you to lose rest or sleep, that is busy stealing your happiness. And that's not the way it's supposed to be. So, so there's a scripture. It's in Luke 16, verse 3, and it says, No one can serve two masters. Either you will hate the one and love the other, or you will be devoted to the one and despise the other. You cannot serve both God and money. And our response to this for most of us in this world is, I don't have a master. Like, this, this wording is so old school. You know, this is not the wording that we would, like, anyone who's got two masters, who serves two masters, either you will hate the one you will love. Like, the wording is in, inappropriate. Like, money is not my master, right? I don't love money. I mean, I earn it, but I don't love it. The reality is, for most of us, when we look at our lives, what we will see and what we will discover is, um, when we stand in front of the mirror, our first response would be, I don't love money. I don't serve money. 
But when we take a step back and we have a view of our lives and we see how we are conducting our lives, it actually becomes pretty um, visible that money is conducting the directing of all our decisions that we're making. So we either serve God or we serve money. Now, uh, a more accurate translation is the word mammon. How, how many of you have heard of the word mammon? Or what is a mammon? This is not a mammon. I'll show you. What? That's not a mammon. That's a mammoth. Different thing. This is a mammon. Mammon is stuff. Everything that's got to do with stuff. Anything that I acquire, that I dream of, the things that I acquire, put together. Um, you know, there's a CD on there for those of you that's under 18. This is how we used to listen to music. Um, and that's a Rubik's Cube. That's what kids used to play with before iPhones. And there's a ball. It's something you used outside. Um, yeah, I know, it's all weird stuff that this guy's got gathered over here. Um, but the reality is we gather and we acquire stuff. So he said, um, you cannot serve both God and you cannot serve both God and your stuff. Um, and, and for us, we justify it and we say, I don't serve my stuff. But Jesus says, listen, you're either going to serve God or you're going to serve your stuff. It's either God or your stuff. So Luke 16, 3 again, no one can serve two masters. Either you will hate the one and love the other, to which we say, I don't love money. I'm master, money's not my master. Okay, uh, he goes on. Or you will be devoted to the one and you will despise the other. You cannot serve both God and money. You will be devoted to Bish, you can just turn the PowerPoint off for me, please. Thanks. You will be devoted to. It's distracting. Of course, I think I, I gave them the wrong one, so, so you guys are, uh, are seeing mine instead of yours. Devoted means the following. Devoted means there is a real strong attachment. That is the quest for. So if you're devoted to stuff, means you've got a quest for it. It means that you've got your eye on it. It means that it's your primary decision-making filter for stuff. So you can either be devoted to God, meaning that you've got your eye on Him. He's a quest for your heart. He's your primary decision-making filter. Or you're going to be devoted to stuff. Which means you've got your eye on it, and it's your primary decision-making filter. We are very devoted to, and we desire stuff. Now, am I saying, are we not supposed to have stuff? Yes, we should have stuff. But God says, this is the biggest competitor between relationship with me for your life. Are things. This is what competes. Now, let me ask you a nice question. Has your desire for something ever caused you to do something stupid? <laughs> now, there wasn't a comma there, so I didn't say, have your desire for something ever caused you to do something stupid? No, it's like, has your desire for something ever caused you to do something stupid? Which is probably the same. <laughs> but it sounds different. Has it? Hello. Man, can I tell you my dumbest one? Okay, you first. <laughs> okay, okay, here's one of my dumbest. So I owned a restaurant in South Africa. Sitting at the restaurant, busy, kind of just um, doing the books, just, you know, managing the restaurant because worked in it. And... Um, there's a guy, one of the waiters says, there's a guy that wants to talk to me. And I said, oh, okay, yeah. So I go over to the guy. And he's sitting at a table, dressed really smart, elegant, right? Um, looks sophisticated. And he, and he said to me, yeah, no, he just wants to know, you know. Um, he's, he's here from Zimbabwe, um, and he's selling diamonds. It's not blood diamonds. I know what you're thinking. So my first thing, thought was, ah, illegal. Don't want to touch it. Stay away from it. Want nothing to do with it, right? First thought, illegal stuff. I said, no, thank you. I'm not interested. He said, no, listen. I know what you're thinking. I know you're thinking illegal. Can't do this wrong blood diamonds. I'm thinking, yes, that is what I was thinking. He said, no, this is not at all. Got paperwork for it. I've got a jeweler 
that committed to buying it. But then when I showed it to him and said to him, listen, you can buy this, um, he said to me that he's overstocked, he can't buy it, he'll even take me to the jeweler. So now I'm thinking, huh, he just has to get rid of it for cost price and I can sell it for this much in a month's time. So I'm going, okay, yeah, well. Um, and I'm thinking what I can buy, what stuff I can buy when I sell this, this stuff, right? So now I say, okay, yeah, let's go to the jeweler. Stand up, walk to the jeweler. Walk into the jewelry store. There's another sophisticated guy standing with a suit. And he walks straight to him, and it's, it's, this guy knows him. And I'm thinking, oh, it's a jewelry store right in, like, right in the same complex. He knows the guy. Walking in, talks to him and said, uh, yeah, this gentleman is interested. It's just He just wants to know if it's legitimate. This is not under the ground. And, and yeah. The whole, it's not a scheme. No, it's legitimate. These things have been verified. This is the value of them. How much are you going to buy it for? Um, and the guy said, I was thinking of charging him this. He said, well, I think you should charge him a little bit less because you're kind of stuck with it now. And the guy said, okay, I'll charge you less. So I'm like, oh, <laughs> like <laughs> this is a score, right? Go out, go draw the money at the ATM, pay the guy. He gives me the, the, the stones. Which is literally just stones. <laughs> so the guy in the suit and the, the guy in the jewelry store didn't even work in the jewelry store. He was just standing there making as if he's interested in buying something. So that's when he walked straight up to him. He was in on it. They were working together. So, so anyway, so you know how long it took me to figure that out? <laughs> Holy Spirit told me immediately after I bought it. <laughs> immediately I knew immediately that was the dumbest thing you've ever done I've got a pastor friend which were even dumber than this pastor he actually owned a jewelry store in South Africa he was a part-time pastor and led a church on, on the side and he used to go buy diamonds in Africa. He's a legal diamond cutter. It's his industry. It's what it is. And he got invited to go buy diamonds in the Congo. Um, they paid for his ticket to come to this mine specifically. He had to bring the money with him. Um, they picked him up at the airport with his briefcase with money with him. Um, they started driving with him. They drove for a few hours. He said they ended up in the wilderness. They didn't know where he was. They took him out of the car. They beat him up. They stripped him naked. It took him two months to come back to South Africa. Two months. We thought he's missing. We thought this guy's gone. Two months. Okay, now your dumb stories. Anybody? <laughs> Beat that. <laughs> no, I'm joking. <laughs> I think there's too many. But we've all done dumb things. Why? Because we are, we've got a desire to acquire more things. Um, your devotion to your desire for stuff and getting what you want um, and what we spend on it, what's happening is it masters us. In the moment, I was mastered. If you ask me, is money my master? I would say to you, no, it's not. In that moment, money was my master. See, in moments, it's not, it's, in general, I will tell you, you know, no, I would never do that. That's the dumbest thing ever. Who would fall for that? In that moment, my desire for stuff mastered me. And I think it's true for many of us. This is how it begins. This is how your, your desire for stuff begins. The desire for more. It, it comes with this word, discontentment. It's the first word, being discontent. So discontentment says the following, I will never be satisfied with what I have because I know what you have and I want what you have. Therefore, I will not be satisfied with what I have. I want what you have. And you know how discontentment is fed? Awareness. Becoming aware. Adam and Eve, best example. Adam and Eve, now just picture this, okay? God created man. And he said, I'm making man in my image and in my likeness. And he formed man, Adam and Eve, beautiful, in the Garden of Eden. Formed Everything for them to eat. Thousands of trees. Trees and fruits that we can't even imagine exist. God created for them. They're living in this garden. Fruit that's no, no um, um, pesticides, no injections, no nothing. Perfect fruit. There weren't insects to bug the fruit. There weren't any of that. Perfect fruit 
every fruit you can think of, sweeter in taste, better smelling. Remember, this is a world that's created fresh. Everything is new. It's like a new car that you get into. Like the leather smells good, right? Done that once, another dumb mistake. Oh, my goodness. <laughs> Besides, okay, so, so uh, Garden of Eden, beautiful. Adam and Eve made beautiful, not wearing any clothes. Yeah, it's like a nude beach. <laughs> not ashamed, right? They're not scared that any. They are made beautifully, and they love each other, and they have sex that is not. There's no filth or ugly or anything in it. It's beautiful. Everything is beautiful. Food, weather, rain, best climate, best place. It ranked on Google's listing number one place to live in the world. <laughs> Amazing. Right? You're living there. And what's even better than that? They had a relationship with God which said God walked in the morning, in the cool of the day. He took their hands and he strolled with them through this garden. They're walking through this garden and they're strolling and they're talking. Like it's... Come on. Amazing. And then what happens is the enemy comes to them. And what does he do? The first thing he does, he makes them discontent with what they have. And how does he do that? He makes them aware of what they cannot have. Did God really say you cannot eat from that one tree? Man, there are thousands of trees. But you cannot eat from that one. Do you know how you're missing out? you know how much you are missing out on life? Because that one thing which was there, but the awareness created discontentment. Some people don't even realize. You know, it's like discontentment and awareness. It's like um, um, somebody saying to you, you know, your wife doesn't know how good she has it. Okay, now that doesn't happen a lot. Um, <laughs> Your husband, <laughs> your husband, he doesn't know how good he has it, right? He doesn't appreciate you the way you should be appreciated. Saying something, you know how amazing, look, oh, you're so beautiful, you're so strong, uh, you know, and suddenly that awareness, you were content and something, something just stirred the discontentment in you. And what it causes in us, it because, becomes something that becomes that we can't feed. And we can't find fulfillment in that one thing. So discontentment is brought on by awareness, but it's also brought on by greed. Being discontent with what we have, that desire for more. If I can just have more, more instead of just managing what I have. It brings, it's, I'm discontent. It comes by awareness, but it comes by greed. Here's the thing about greed. Greed. None of you are greedy. Most of you are greedy. Because the thing about greed is we can't see it in the mirror. Like we stand in front of the mirror and we go, yeah, I give it a little bit, right? Yeah, I'm, I'm a good guy. You know, I'll buy a sandwich for somebody next to the street. You know, I'm a good guy. I'm not greedy. You know how Jesus defines greed? He said, greed is the assumption that it's all for my consumption. Greed is the assumption that if it's placed in my hands, it's for me. Now, again, for us, we're going, yeah, that kind of sounds right to me. But the reality is, if it's placed in our hands, it's because God says, I want you to manage it on my behalf. We're supposed to manage his resources the way he wants us to manage it. Why? Because I'm sowing into my life for happiness. I'm basing my sowing on what his word says. His word says I'm a steward of his kingdom. So I'm going to manage things the way he says I must manage it. If you live with the assumption that everything is placed in your hands for your consumption, you are a greedy person. If that offends you, if everything is for you, you will use it for you. I should have probably said, I'm sorry. But I, it is, that's real. It's sometimes it's the only place where we can really see ourselves is when we're confronted with the word and saying, listen, it's not about the, the pennies that you give away. 
It's understanding that God, you've blessed us with this body. You've blessed us with this home. You've blessed us with, God, I am a vessel for you. I trust you. The problem with greed is it's got an appetite that cannot be satisfied. Everything's placed in my hand for me, so I'm going to spend it on me. Now I see my neighbor as something better. So I want to spend everything that's in my hand for me, on me, on something that me can't afford. Which brings me to another happy word. Debt. (laughs) Doesn't that just give you the fizzies? Like, oh, debt. It's like, oh, say it again. Debt. Oh. Huh? How does it, all of you feel the same when you hear that word? It's so good. It's warm and fuzzy. Debt is ugly. Debt is, is something which we have. I want is better than I owe. Everybody say that with me. I want is better than I owe. Not own. Owe. Say it again. I want is better than I owe. I want is you being in relationship with God, going, God, I would, tr- I, I really want that. And God saying, Andreas, you can't have that. Why? <laughs> because you have to manage, manage your finances and you want to be happy and you want to have peace and you don't want to sleep with anxiety. I still don't get it. Why not? I can charge it. Like not charging. It's like so 17th century to not just buy it with debt, right? I mean, it's so my great grandparents would not buy it. But we live in a world where we can just charge it. And God said, listen, don't do it. Manage your finances. Manage it because you are sowing for, for peace. I'm sowing for peace. So what do Andreas do? He goes and he goes and buys it. Now, it's no longer I want. Now it's I owe. Now, in I want, the world of I want, I have conversation with God regarding God, I really want this. And God says no. So then I step into the world of I owe. Do you know what happens in the world of I owe? God changes sides. He does. Because he's on the side of the one you owe the money to. He is for us paying and repaying our debts. He paid debt more than we can imagine. He's for the payment of debt. So now we're sitting in I.O. and we go, oh God, please help me. And God's like, pay. (laughs) Have you ever been there? And it's based on, have you ever done something stupid? Stupid. Yes. Debt, we become a slave to it. And here's the crazy thing. The more money we have, the more money we think we can owe. We're supposed to manage it. Now, I'm going to finish with this. Which one of these three words make you feel like really happy? Okay, I'm going to give you three words. Which ones make you? Discontentment. Like any bubbles? No. Greed? Nothing. Debt? Nobody. Yes. You know why? Because it's not happy words. Here's life application. You ready for it? Life application for those things. Very practical. Stop it. (laughs) Stop. On, On the PowerPoint, I had four slides that said stop because I wanted to repeat them. Stop it. Take that thing of where you think your happiness is in stuff and understand it's not in stuff. It's in how you manage the resources that God has given you so that you can be a steward, somebody that he can use. But not just somebody he can use, so that you can have happiness. So here's the three words that we live by in our home. And it's based on two words. If you take everything that Jesus said regarding finances in the Bible, it can be summed up in two words, generosity and wisdom. Everything Jesus said regarding finances, generosity, and wisdom. So in our home, we have three words that we live by. And I learned this from a teaching from Andy Stanley years ago. And the three words is give, save, 
and live. My, why? Because God said you cannot serve two masters. Man cannot serve both mammon, money, and God. You cannot serve God or money. Right? It's one of the two. The one you serve, the other one becomes subject to it. If I serve money, stuff, right, this kingdom that I'm building, if I serve that, God becomes a subject to everything that money decides. Money decides I need to hold back more. So God's principles of sowing into people's lives, being generous, being kind, nah, uh, uh, uh. submit to money. I can only give this little bit. And it applies for all the principles in your life. Because, I, you know, I really want to get that car. But God says, I can't afford that car. So I'm going to go into debt. So God goes where? Mm-hmm. Underneath. But the one, if we serve God, we listen to the relationship, to His guidance, to His wisdom. And we know that He speaks in generosity and wisdom into our lives, to our finances. We can apply give, save, live. So why do I I have it in that order? The reason I have give first is because that is how I say to my finances, you are submitting to God. I take my, my income that I get and I tithe. It's a principle our home believes in. I believe in it. I've seen the fruit of it. You don't have to do it. You don't have to suffer. You don't. You don't. I honestly believe it. It's a principle in my life. We've applied it. I've seen the fruit of it. And, and, and I'm applying it for the right reasons. With clarity, with vision, and why God has told me to do it. With wisdom. That's why I'm applying it. So I'm applying these principles. I give. In my giving, I'm saying, God, my finances is submitted to you first. And I'm saying to mammon, listen, you will submit to God. And the way I'm proving it to you is I'm giving some of you away to start off with. The second thing I do is I save. We plan. Irma and I plan for the future of our kids, for our home, where we want to be. And then after I've saved, after I've given, given, saved. Now, this is what we have left to live with. Okay. So we live, and then we manage our lives based on what we are living with. Are we missing out on anything? No, I'm not. I've got a happy home. Listen, I'd rather have happiness than your house, your car, or your holiday, and not have it. I'd rather have what I have. Do I make stupid mistakes? I do. God's grace is there to help me. And then we sow our way out of it again. But my goal is to stay faithful to what he is saying. Here's the summary, the last three things. Giving gives you joy. Saving gives you peace. And then you can live in freedom. You know what makes you happy? It's not a what, it's a who. You have to sow yourself in the right direction and be generous and use wisdom with your finances. And money can make you happy. Amen. Let's pray. Father God, I'm, th- I'm thankful that you love us. I'm thankful for your wisdom. I'm thankful for your insight. And I'm thankful, Father, that you spoke so clearly about this area in our lives where we need guidance and direction and wisdom. So Father, I pray that for every single person here, whatever we might have come in with in our mindsets in regard to finances, Father, we are not wringing our hands for other people's money. It's about principles that you want us to apply to our lives for us to have happy lives. So Father, I just pray that people take it, use it, apply it, because I want to see happy people the same way you want to, Lord. I pray your blessing of every person that was here, over every home, and we're thankful that you are our God. In Jesus' wonderful name we pray. Amen. Amen, everybody. We love you guys. Um, remember next week.